Before the king and the gathered palace elders, including a dubious fetish priest, Awa stood firm, his heart clear of guilt. He declared to the chief and elders, My farms hide nothing sinister, but if the gods disagree, I welcome your search. His voice carried a serene honesty as they followed him to his lands, a heavy air of suspicion looming over them. As they reached the verdant expanse of the first farm, the fetish priest began his eerie incantations, invoking the deities with fervent zeal. Mighty gods of our realm, never have you forsaken your servant. Reveal any secrets that lie hidden here. Show your formidable power to all present. His words echoed ominously across the fields. Elder Sapong, amidst the onlookers, sensed deceit. He knew of schemes woven to tarnish the innocent. Soon, at the priest's command, they dug at a specified spot. Tension spiked as their shovels struck something solid. A chilling discovery unfolded before their eyes. The skeletal remains of a long-buried body unearthed from the earth's grip. A collective gasp shattered the silence. Kneeling, Awa faced the priest, his expression a blend of sorrow and defiance. If this is the truth the gods reveal, I accept my fate. But if this is a man's doing, let it be known. The evil that men sow shadows their steps, forever haunting them. When Elder Sarpong glimpsed the chilling sight of the dead body, he knew the Queen and the other Elder's nefarious plan had ensnared Awa in an inescapable trap. Heart pounding with dread and determination, he swiftly departed the scene and hurried to Awa's home to warn his wife, Asabea. Time is against us, Sarpong breathed out, his words heavy with urgency. You must flee now, before it's too late. Asabea's heart sank at his words. A painful realization washed over her. She might never see her husband again. Awar had confided in her about the plot against him, but the reality of their dire situation hit hard and fast. With no time to spare, Elder Sarpong whisked Asabea away, leaving his own wife and children behind. The decision agonizing but necessary given the peril at hand. Meanwhile, back at Awa's expansive farms, the search continued relentlessly. In each of the ten farms, more grim discoveries were made. Bodies buried deep within the earth, their skeletal remains a silent testament to the grim tale being woven against him. Overwhelmed by the mounting evidence, Awa knelt amidst his ruined legacy, his voice broken with despair. O oh, gods of our land, was my error simply being too kind, he cried out. Why bless me with wealth, if only to strip it away so disgracefully? The fetish priest looked on, his voice cold and final. Now the gods have ended your supposed benevolence, peace will return to our kingdom. As the guards uncovered the skeletons on Awa's farm, they brutally seized him, beating him as they dragged him through the dirt to the palace. Awa, once the epitome of love and the very pillar of the kingdom, was now smeared with the mud of disgrace. This man, who had nourished and uplifted his community, who had been their savior in times of need, found himself forsaken by the very people he had once saved. It was a bitter truth that kindness and love could be repaid with such vile betrayal. Humans often forget the good, their memories clouded by fleeting grievances. The hearts of men brimmed with dark shadows of envy and spite. In the palace, the plot by the elders and the queen had reached its cruel climax, their scheme ripping apart the fabric of a good man's life. When the king, Shaken by the revelations from Awa's farm, confronted him with the horrifying accusations. Awa's response was tinged with a resigned sorrow. My king, do you trust me? Will you believe my words? He implored. With the weight of the world on his shoulders, he continued. I know nothing of these crimes. My heart remains pure and my conscience clear. 
yet I stand powerless against the supposed will of the gods. His plea hung heavy in the air, a poignant testament to a soul wronged by fate and the fickle nature of those he once called friends. As Awa stood there, the embodiment of betrayed innocence, the palace echoed with the silence of truth unheeded, marking the tragic downfall of a man who was once a beacon of hope and generosity. In the hushed, tense air of the royal court, the elders presented their grim accusations before the king. This man, sire, is no more than a wolf in sheep's clothing. Imagine the evil. It takes a dark soul to sacrifice ten lives in pursuit of wealth. Their words painted Awa as a monster, a bringer of death hidden behind a facade of kindness. The king, bound by the heavy chains of tradition that demanded justice, even death for such acts, felt his heart waver. If he chose mercy for Awa, he risked inciting chaos among the elders and tearing his kingdom apart. The queen, sensing his hesitation, pressed closer, her voice a whisper laced with urgency. Everyone's eyes are upon you. To forgive such a murderer would invite lawlessness upon our land. You cannot show weakness. Little did the king know, a sinister plot had woven its threads deep into the fabric of this tragedy. In days long past, the lives of servants and slaves held little value, often overlooked and easily forgotten. Seizing upon this grim reality, the Queen and the Elders, along with a handful of trusted guards, had orchestrated a heinous plan. They sent unsuspecting servants to Awa's farm under the cover of night. There the guards would strike, ending lives with a swift blow, burying the evidence in the rich soil of the farm. Each body was a secret planted, a part of their dark design. When the time came, they directed the fetish priest to these graves, ensuring he would find the evidence needed to condemn Awa. The priest confidently marked the spots where the bodies lay hidden, his deceit masked by feigned divinity. Awa, the once cherished pillar of the community, was left to face the crushing weight of betrayal and manipulation, his fate a cruel echo of forgotten souls. The chilling evidence laid before the king mandated a harsh decree. Awa was to be executed publicly, but the plot thickened as the queen and the elders demanded that Awa's wife too should face the same fate, believing she was complicit in the crimes. The king, troubled by these demands, sent guards to fetch her for questioning. Upon reaching their home, they found it empty, her absence fueling suspicions of her guilt. The queen, seizing upon this, persuaded the king to issue a dire proclamation. The wife was wanted, dead or alive, her disappearance proof of her involvement. On the day of execution, the air was heavy with grief, the scene mirroring a somber funeral. Tears streamed down the faces of women, children and elders alike, all united in their pleas for mercy. They begged the king to reconsider, their cries a haunting chorus of despair. However, the queen, ever manipulative, whispered poison into the king's ear. She painted Awa's popularity as a direct threat to his rule, claiming the people's love for him overshadowed their loyalty to the crown. This is your chance to secure your throne, she insisted coldly. Do not temper justice with mercy. Let the execution proceed as the law demands. Her words, laced with deceit, aimed to sever the last threads of compassion from the king's heart, urging him to a ruthless judgment that would silence not just Awa, but any dissent within his reign. In the shadow of an impending tragedy, the king addressed his people, his voice heavy with sorrow. I share your sadness, he began, for I too have been touched by Awa's kindness. Yet our laws demand that we do not shelter murderers, no matter how benevolent. It pains me, but to preserve justice, I must order his execution. The crowd gathered a sea of mournful faces as the king turned to Awa for. 
any final words. Standing with a somber dignity, Awa looked out over those he had served and loved. I devoted my life to the betterment of our kingdom, and this, death and disgrace, is my reward. Do not weep for me. I only hope that one day the truth will emerge and justice will visit those who engineered my downfall. As the executioner stepped forward, a startling twist unfolded. The fetish priest, believed dead at the hands of the queen for his defiance, staggered into the crowd. Gasps rippled through as he declared, The gods have spoken. If Awa dies, disaster will befall this kingdom. His daughter will end your reign, and calamity will consume your lineage. The queen's face blanched at the sight of the priest she thought she had silenced. His prophetic words hung in the air, a dire warning that shifted the scales of fate, leaving the crowd and the king in stunned silence, contemplating the grave decision that lay before them. The queen and a deceitful fetish priest whispered to the king that the gods favored their rule, promising prosperity once Awa was gone. With heavy heart but swayed by their words, the king ordered Awa's execution. As Awa fell, the palace's mood was one of dark relief. His death a victory for the queen and elders who saw him as a thorn in their side. They rejoiced, believing they could now voice their opinions freely, unchallenged in the palace corridors. Meanwhile, Elder Sarpong, who had always stood by Awa, was conspicuously absent from the palace meeting that followed. His absence stirred suspicions. The queen, uneasy, sent guards to fetch him, but they returned with news of an empty home. It dawned on everyone that Sarpong might have aided the escape of Awa's wife, Asabia, marking him as a traitor. In a swift act of retaliation, the queen ordered the capture of Sarpong's family. His wife and two children, ages 10 and 13, mere teenagers, were taken and imprisoned, their lives upturned by accusations and the heavy cost of loyalty in a kingdom rife with deceit and betrayal. The fetish priest, having narrowly escaped death by the queen's hand, set out on a mission filled with resolve and remorse. He was determined to find Asabia and convey the tragic news of her husband, Awara's execution, along with a divine prophecy given to him by the gods. Asabia, along with Elder Sarpong, had found refuge in a distant community, where the mention of her beloved husband's name opened doors. His reputation as a kind and just man had reached even this far-off place, earning them the sympathy and support of the local king. When the weary fetish priest finally arrived, his presence brought a somber air. He gently broke the news of Awa's death to Asabia, a moment heavy with sorrow. Yet, within this cloud of despair, he also delivered a glimmer of hope from the gods. They had foretold that Asabia would bear a daughter destined for greatness, a child who would carry forward her father's legacy of benevolence and justice. The priest handed Asabia a shimmering golden ring, a powerful symbol of her future daughter's path. When she reaches the age of 18, give her this ring. It will guide her to her destiny, he instructed. Turning to Elder Sarpong, he shared a grim caution. Your family is imprisoned, held as leverage against you. The Queen plans to execute them should you be captured. You must protect Asabia and her unborn child at all costs. His words, imbued with urgency and care, left Sarpong and Asabia with a heavy burden of protection and a flicker of hope for redemption through the life growing within Asabia. The tragic death of Awa only served to empower the queen and the elders further, leaving the king virtually powerless as they tightened their grip on the kingdom. With malice and greed, they seized lands from the poor and oppressed the people who had no one left to champion their cause. The path to the king was barricaded by these corrupt elders, who ensured no one could reach him to speak of the injustices unfolding under their rule. 
In this climate of fear and suppression, the common folk mourned not only for Awa, but for their own voiceless plight, cast adrift without a protector, their hope dwindling day by day. Amidst this sorrow, a spark of joy appeared. Asabea, in a distant land, gave birth to a beautiful baby girl named Nshiraba. This birth, symbolizing new hope, coincidentally aligned with a tragic event in the palace. The queen's only son succumbed to a mysterious illness on the very same day. With no heir apparent, the king, still young at 30, clung to the hope of another child. However, as the queen sought answers from herbalists and spiritualists, she was confronted with a harsh truth. The gods had revoked her son as retribution for the innocent blood she had spilled. Fearing for her life, she kept this divine admonition secret from the king, burying the guilt deep within as her kingdom, ruled by fear and betrayal, awaited the eventual rise of young Nanshiraba, whose destiny was yet to unfold. As Nashiraba grew up, she often asked about her father. Her mother, Asabia, spoke of him with warmth, repeating the message he had left for his daughter, that he was a good man. Elder Sapong, however, harbored a deep bitterness towards the king, the queen, and the elders for their roles in the tragic events. He watched as Asabia shielded her daughter from the cruel truth of her father's fate, a secret heavy on his heart. By the time Nishiraba reached 18, she'd grown into a young woman of remarkable wisdom and intelligence, mirroring her father's virtues. One fateful night, Elder Sarpong could no longer keep the past buried. He called Nishiraba to him and poured out the truth the story of her father's kindness, the conspiracy by the queen and the elders that led to his unjust demise. Enshiraba wept through the night, her heart breaking with each revelation. By dawn, her tears had forged a resolve. She approached Elder Sarpong and declared, I must return to my father's land to right the wrongs against him. I will clear his name, restore his dignity, and seek justice for his death. With a spirit fueled by the love for a father she never knew and the pain of a betrayal she could barely comprehend, Nashiraba prepared to confront her past and challenge those who had wronged her family. As Nshiraba prepared to reclaim her father's tarnished legacy, Elder Sarpong stood by her with unwavering support. He knew the time had come for her to restore her father's reputation and seek justice for his untimely death. However, her mother, Asabea, was stricken with fear for her daughter's safety. Nshiraba, since your father's death, I've remained alone, and you are my everything, she pleaded. Going back to that kingdom is like walking into a lion's den. Those people are not just powerful, they're merciless. I fear they might harm you. Let your father rest in peace. I can't bear the thought of losing you, too. Despite her mother's fears, Nshiraba's resolve was unshakable. Seeing her determination, Asabia reluctantly agreed to help her daughter prepare for the journey. Before Nshiraba departed, Elder Sarpong handed her crucial information about the palace, and her mother presented her with the golden ring given by the fetish priest during her pregnancy. This ring symbolizes favor, luck and protection, Elder Sarpong explained. In moments of great danger, it will tighten around your finger as a warning. With a heavy heart, but a spirit fueled by courage, Nshiraba bid farewell to her mother and Elder Sarpong. She embarked on her quest, the weight of her father's legacy, a constant companion. This stirring tale of bravery and justice will unfold in our next episode. We thank you for joining us on this emotional journey through Anand's web of tales. Please subscribe to our channel, share your thoughts, and let us know which flag represents your country in this video. Your support and interaction 
are greatly appreciated.